Last week we talked about the spiritual discipline of solitude. <clears throat> Henry Nouwen writes these words, Without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We need to set aside a time and a space to give God our unabided attention. That's from Henry Nouwen. Are you spending time in solitude? We're talking this morning about service and serving the other people around us. So solitude is one part of spiritual formation and spirituality. But we also need to be active and out there loving people and taking care of people and meeting their needs. We understand that our Heavenly Father interacts with us because He desires that relationship with us. And for this to happen on an individual basis, for you and I to enjoy that relationship, God had to send His Son to die in our place. It cost Him something. Relationship with us cost Him someone. This contingency did not stop Him from pursuing us, from saving us, from loving us, and serving us. Can we love somebody else even when it costs us something? Serving others is sacrificial. So we spend time in solitude to cultivate our relationship with God, but we don't stay in solitude. We go out and we do something and we make a difference. The question is, can we do this knowing that it may cost us something? Serving others is sacrificial. We exchange pride for humility. We exchange selfishness for selflessness. The spiritual practice, this very discipline of serving, requires us to change our expectations. A shift truly happens in our lives. So today we're going to begin with the Gospel of John, and we're going to get a little snapshot of what a humble, selfless service looks like from Jesus himself. It was contrary to everything that was expected of Jesus. You see, it was customary for guests to have their feet washed upon entry to a house. They wore sandals, the roads were dirty. This was a common courtesy for a slave or a servant of the household to wash the people's feet, this menial task. This is the situation that Jesus and his disciples find themselves in. They have dirty feet, but there's no servant in the house to wash them. Oh, and by the way, the disciples, they were arguing with each other about who is the greatest among them. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. So Jesus and the disciples are eating a meal with dirty feet. What happens? We look at John chapter 13, verse 3. <laughs> Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I find it interesting that John includes verse 3. Why would John include verse 3 in this? Because Jesus knows his place in the Father's plan. He knows his place in the Father's presence. Clearly, Jesus doesn't allow pride to impede his call to be a servant. So what does he do? He gets up. He takes off his outer garment. He wraps the towel around his waist. Basically what Jesus is doing is assuming the full costume of a servant. How many kids out there are going as a servant for Halloween? Not a very popular thing, I'm sure. And then he pours water into a basin. And he washes the disciples' feet. He becomes the slave. He becomes the servant. Now why didn't the disciples do this? I mean, Jesus holds preeminent position in God's kingdom. Surely he could have delegated this responsibility to somebody else. But that's not what he does. He takes on the role of a servant and he washes their dirty, stinky feet. And the story has a twist. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. 
Peter, like all of us, recognizes the craziness of the situation. No, Jesus, you are not lowering yourself to a place of a slave or a servant to do this for us. Clearly, Peter doesn't understand what's happening. And that's no surprise, because often Peter has a dull mind and doesn't understand what's going on. After Jesus tells Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me, what does Peter do? He overreacts like he always does. He overcorrects himself. Well, then wash my hands and my head as well. Jesus finally offers his explanation. John chapter 13, verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so am I. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also to wash one another's feet. Hey guys, I'm giving you an example to follow. This is exactly what Jesus is doing. I'm giving you an example to follow of how you should live your life. Life with God is a life of service. It is a life of service. The teaching is obvious. If Jesus, the greatest among them, willingly serves them, then there's no excuse for any of them to disdain serving others. We exchange pride for humility. We exchange selfishness for selflessness. And Jesus leads by example. Verse 15. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I've done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Do you understand what we're learning today? To follow Jesus is to engage in acts of service. He washes the feet. You realize that Jesus washes the feet of the person who's going to deny him. You realize that in this moment, Jesus is washing the feet of the person who's going to betray him. But that doesn't stop him. Understand, it is with confidence that Jesus serves with compassion. That's what makes verse 3 so important and so powerful. Jesus knows who he is. He knows where he's going and he knows what he's doing. He is secure in his identity. You understand confidence is the impetus for compassion. Confidence comes with understanding our place in God's plan, and compassion is the byproduct. We can reach out and serve others because we are certain of God's presence with us and His purpose for us. Jesus gives us the example. Now let's contrast that moment with the attitude of the disciples. You understand that leading up to this washing of their feet, they are arguing. There are some who maintain that their arguing actually prevents them from seeing the need. Seeing the need and doing something about it. A quick reflection for a moment. Could that be the case for some churches? Could that really be the case for some churches? They are so busy arguing over trivial matters that serving others never happens. I want this. You want that. We compare our spirituality with people around us. I'm better than you. No, I'm better than you. Hmm. Selfishness does not yield service. It all begins with a mother's request. She's a mother. She wants what's best for her children, right? Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. You understand to sit in these two places is to have the place of position and authority and influence. Why did mom ask what I want to know? Were the disciples too chicken to go do it themselves? Maybe. Maybe their mother was overly protective and concerned about her kids that she took matters into her own hands. Either way, the request does not go unnoticed by the other disciples. When they find out what these two guys were looking for, jealousy 
and pride lead to an argument. Matthew chapter 20, verse 22. Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. By the way, that cup is a cup of suffering. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it had been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. Some scholars believe that this drama is happening just prior to the meal that Jesus has with his disciples. The very meal where Jesus washes their feet. Arguing. Arguing impedes ministry. Jealousy impedes service. And so Jesus gets on and talks about true greatness. Matthew chapter 20 verse 25. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you see what's going on here? Jesus corrects the misguided aspirations of his disciples. He's responding to men who are seeking security and certainty and recognition. And Jesus upends their attempt at self-preservation and self-protection. You see what's going on here? It is with pride that the disciples are grasping for power. It is with pride that they're grasping for power. You know the biblical text, right? Pride comes before what? It comes before the fall. Thankfully, Jesus is willing to teach and train and correct these disciples before that fall comes. We would be wise to listen and to follow Jesus. Here's what I want you to know today. Greatness is not found in your, disp in your position. It is found in your disposition. I've shared that comment before. I thought it was worth sharing again. Greatness is not found in your position. It is found in your disposition. Jesus doesn't condemn aspirations for greatness. He just redirects them. Greatness isn't found in power or prestige or position or popularity. Greatness is found in our disposition. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Which, by the way, is eternal. You want to be great? Be a servant. How, when, where do we serve? Serve your family, serve your friends, serve your colleagues, maybe even your boss. Serve your neighbor, your enemy, serve even a stranger. The greatest among us are those who serve. We identify three shifts in the way those who serve are treated by God. And so the world, what does it do? The world honors the rich. The world honors the powerful, the celebrity, the successful. A shift takes place when it comes to God's kingdom. You see, God honors the humble. God honors the humble. We know that our nation is good about honoring those who serve in our military. One of the things I like about Blues Hockey is during the second period, they pause and they recognize a military servant. More than this, individuals honor soldiers as well. After stopping at Dunkin' Donuts, Samantha Brown returned to her car to find an envelope left on her windshield. Inside, she found two $20 bills and a note that read, I noticed the sticker on the back of your car. Take your hero out to dinner when he comes home. Thank you both for serving. Him deployed and you waiting. And it was signed, United States Veteran, God Bless. You see, the sticker on the back of the card read this. Half of my heart is in Afghanistan. The heart is her boyfriend, Albert, who was serving abroad in the army. So Brown, once she received this, she went home and she got on Facebook and posted the, a picture of this anonymous gift. And above the photo, she wrote these words. There are no words to describe how I'm feeling right now. Tears in my eyes. I just wish I could thank whoever did this. God bless our troops and all those who stand behind them. 
that picture racked up more than 1.2 million likes. And it got over 142,000 shares. When Samantha was finally able to tell Albert about that touching story, this is what he said. It's people like this who make him proud to be an American soldier. America honors soldiers. Why? Because they sacrificially and selflessly serve their country. As amazing as this is, and they should be recognized, we understand that God honors those who serve in His kingdom. John, James chapter 4, verse 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you see the contrast here in spiritual attitude? The arrogant thumb their nose at God, and they selfishly pursue earthly pleasure. The contrite, those who willingly, joyfully, and regularly serve the people around them, they admit their sinfulness and selflessly seek the way of God. <laughs> the rewards of the world are given to those who are driven. The rewards of the world are given to the innovators and the entertainers. But there's a shift that takes place in the kingdom of God. God rewards His servants. Are you involved in any of these reward programs? I'm digging some of these re reward programs, actually. Simply shopping at Kroger, and believe me, I'm shopping for a family of five, you can rack up some major discounts on some gas, right? I think at one point we almost got a dollar off a gallon of gas. I like that. Bring it on, Mr. Grocer. One World, that restaurant, you ever been there? It's one of those that has a rewards program. Spend 50 bucks, you get a $5 coupon. That gluten-free hearty country pizza, it's kind of like the bomb, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the perks of being a loyal customer. I like rewards programs. As we serve others, the spiritual practice that defines a life with God, we learn that God rewards His servants. Matthew chapter 23, verse 11. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Those who exalt themselves will be rewarded with humility, and those who humble themselves will be rewarded with exaltation. Don't we want to be exalted by God? Do you want to be promoted on the day of judgment, or do you want to be demoted? on the day of judgment. That is the deal. God's going to recognize you for your humble service. He's going to uplift you. Do you see that the way up is the way down? The world promises money and attention, recognition, even fame. But there's a shift that takes place in the kingdom of God. God promises His blessing. We know that it's an election year, right? Politicians are ramping up their campaign promises. Taxes, reducing the deficit, job creation, women's rights, pension reform. They're all typical, right, campaign parts of Illinois politics. But how often do their promises go unfulfilled? One candidate promises to raise taxes, the other one promises to lower taxes. Who's going to win? Which policy is better? I don't know. All I know is they got to work with a lot of people to get the job done. And most of the time it doesn't get done, right? Because there's so much stalemate. This isn't the case with our God. If God promises to do something, He's going to do it. We find out one of these problems, utter promises, excuse me, uttered by Jesus after He washes the disciples' feet and tells them to do the same. John 13, 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. It's not if we know these things, since we know these things. You've been equipped today. You've just been equipped with the teaching of Jesus, okay? You know. Serve others. And we are blessed if we follow through. Understand, Jesus condemned those who hear his words and fail to do it. Jesus promises blessing for those who hear his words and do them. Do you want to be commended by Jesus or do you want to be condemned by Jesus? your acts of service, or your lack of service. The Commendation Medal is a mid-level United States military decoration, which is presented for sustained acts of heroism and meritorious service. Our commendation 
is blessing for our service in the kingdom of God. What is this blessing? It is God's approval, both now and forever. So greatness is not found in our advantage. It is found in our attitude. Not to our advantage, it is found in our attitude. You see, advantage comes with skill and intellect, with money and authority. Jesus' words offer us an important reminder. Greatness is not found in the advantage we are given, that we gain or we earn. Greatness is found in the attitude we carry, like Jesus, who has the greatest advantage over everyone. Why does Jesus have the greatest advantage? Because he's God. That's why. He has the greatest advantage. But he says, be a servant. Arthur Ashe, great tennis player. True hero heroism is remarkably sober, very undramatic. It is not the urge to surpass all others at whatever cost, but the urge to serve others at whatever cost. <clears throat> Paul writes these words to the early church. We're going to read from Philippians as we conclude the sermon today. The words still resonate with us today. This is from the translation, the message. Eugene Peterson translated this. I'm just going to offer up my condolences because he passed away this past week. What an amazing dude he was. Translating the Bible, writing books. Anyway, this is his translation. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Unity in a church, unity in a community is forged with humility. It is pride and ego that wreak havoc on a community. Selfish ambition and conceit militate against unity. What we think matters. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. It's about attitude, people. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privilege of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Privilege and advantage are not characteristics lauded in the kingdom of God. Christ had every advantage and every privilege while walking on the earth. He is God. And yet he didn't use his God card while he was on our planet. He took the status of a slave, of a servant. Selfless, obedient, humble, even to the point of death on the cross. I'm going to give props out to my buddy Yadier Molina. He was rewarded the Roberto Clemente Award for his humanitarian efforts and service in Puerto Rico. It's a great honor to win, he said, this award, and it's even more special to me because I'm Puerto Rican. Molina said, For us, Clemente is a hero and a legend, and we highly respect and admire him, not only as one of the greatest players, but as a humanitarian who lost his life helping those in need to be associated with him is a true privilege. You understand, Clemente lost his life serving others. He was flying planes into areas that needed help, and the plane crashed and he died. His legacy continues through those who carry on the work of helping people in need. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, we pick back up. Because of that obedience, 
God lifted him, Jesus, high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, <clears throat> will bow and worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Jesus is humble, evidenced by his death on the cross. God honors the humble. How does God honor Jesus? He rewards him by exalting him to the greatest place in all the universe. <laughs> Jesus is exalted. I'm encouraging you today to engage the world with God's love. And the way we do that is by getting out there and serving somebody. Put your pride in your back pocket. Take your conceit, throw it out the window, and start serving somebody. You've been equipped today with the teaching of Jesus. You've been empowered to go out there and do something. Who is it that you need to serve this week? Somebody in your house? Somebody in your neighborhood? Somebody on campus? Somebody at work? Who is it that you need to serve? God, we come before you today with an amazing example of service on behalf of your son, Jesus. That being God in the flesh, he decided to take on the role of a slave and a servant, not just to give his disciples an example, but to actually show compassion. God, I pray that you would help us to put away our pride so that we can engage the people around us. Put away our looking at ourselves so that we can look at the need around us. God, I thank you for the example, and I thank you for your love among us. May we share that love with the people around us. Jesus' name.